Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe, and on behalf of the Minneapolis Club and my firm, Brimacombe Capital, welcome to Club E. Our discussion today is igniting entrepreneurship early, starting and running businesses in your 20s and 30s. So first question I'm going to ask is, who all uh, in the audience are business folks in their 20s and 30s? Let me just see a show of hands. Okay. I, I saw a few liars in there. I saw a few liars. Okay, how about entrepreneurs and budding business people in the audience who are under 20? Oh, we have one over here. Let's all give Isabel a round of applause. Not only that, but uh, Isabel's dad pulled her from school because this was going to be so close to her heart and what she was going to learn. So I think that's a wonderful job. In fact, let's give dad a round of applause. We won't tell your teacher, so as far as we know, you're homesick. <laughs> Before we get to uh, today's panel, I first want to thank our Club E sponsors. Irish Titan is an e-commerce and strategic digital agency. Boulay CPAs and business advisors, and I know I have a couple of Boulay folks. Uh, Tom Johnson is here, uh, Jay Trumbauer, we've got over on that side of the room. Thank you, uh, Boulay, and folks for being sponsors. Highland Bank is a local family owned community bank. I have a couple of folks from Highland Bank. I have Rick Wall here, I have Troy Rosenbrock here, Ryan, Aaron, Aaron's over here. Raise your hand all. Thanks for. Highland Bank for um, being a sponsor and participating with um, our event. Winthrop and Weinstein is a general practice law firm. Minnesota Sales Institute works with companies' leadership and sales teams to increase revenue. And Scott Plum is over here to my left. Thank you, Scott, for being here. And then the Network Connect is a catalytic gateway for connecting investors, companies, service providers. Um, and Dick Summerstead is right here in the middle. Dick is my partner in that business. Um, in fact, while I'm on that one, before we move on, the Network Connect has an event in April. And if you want to touch base with Dick to learn more about that. Uh, folks um, and companies are out uh, raising money. It's a good event for, for people to get uh, tied into that. All right, so uh, brown paper ticket is how we RSVP for these events. Um, again, uh, to the extent that you can do the brown paper ticket, it works better for the club, so please do that. They shut down the RSVPs 24 hours in advance. Um, Clubby.com, you can get connected uh, there, learn about future events, get on the newsletter, check out videos of past events, uh, join the membership roster. Uh, LinkedIn group, we have Clubby uh, dash Minneapolis, got about 2,800 folks in that group if you'd like to get connected there there's also a meetup group for club e and um, an email list as well so if you give me your card um, I can get you on the email list Minneapolis Club uh, is a wonderful place to do business uh, as well as to do things from a personal standpoint I've been a member for about 20 years and they've been my partner doing club e since 2007 if anybody would like to learn more about the Minneapolis Club please uh, seek me out um, big party on Saturday. If anybody's looking for something to do, I can tell you more about that. Um, going back to the network uh, connect just for a moment, Lessons from the Garage is a video series. Think of Netflix for business owners and entrepreneurs trying to grow their business. Uh, you can learn more about that. Again, Lessons from the Garage. Seek Dick out um, over there. And then lastly, uh, Tom, why don't you come on up for a moment? Um, introduced uh, um, a gentleman from Boulay last time. And in case anybody didn't know, and this is a shock to you, it's tax season. And so just a real uh, quick introduction uh, from one of our sponsors, uh, Boulay. Tom. All right, great. Thank you. Just want to let you know how happy we are to be here. Jay and I are here. We've been coming for, you know, this year being a sponsor. It's wonderful. It's tax season. And we are in the throes. So if you have any tax questions, you can call Jay. He'd be happy to answer all of those questions. Um, but if you want to find us, go to boulegroup.com, and you can see just what we do. Thanks, Thank Rick. And, and I have, oh, yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Ser seriously, these events would not happen without the sponsorship support, so please uh, use uh, their services if, if you can. I've interacted with all of them personally and use them for both myself as well as portfolio companies. And so they're a wonderful roster of um, sponsors. And um, 
talking about the tapping into the taxes and Jay, if you didn't know, Jay's the COO, CFO, not a tax person, but I do have a cell phone. So if anybody, if anybody has a serious tax question late at night or the weekends, I can refer you to Jay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I put these on the table. These have a list of future events as well as a sheet of paper. You can take notes from today's panel if you would like. Um, I won't go through all of the upcoming events, but uh, just to let you know that March 18th, Club E St. Paul has Why They Buy. Chum Struvy is right up here in front. Uh, March 19th, we have Club E Maple Grove Defend Your Business. It's a cybersecurity conversation. And then also, uh, uh, March 19th here in Minneapolis, Club E and Upsize Magazine is doing mergers and acquisitions, due diligence and business valuations, um, a number of, of other events. But again, uh, you can get that list off of here or you can go to clube.com. Okay, so with that, um, as we aim towards our panel, why don't I invite you all up? And then um, for those of you who haven't met Lucas Harmon yet, Lucas is the smallest uh, gentleman of the group over here. So Lucas um, is my associate and has been working with me since uh, last summer, and he's doing a great job. And it's an uh, honor and a privilege to have him on our team. You all can hit your spots up there, that table here. And um, So anyway, so Lucas, given he's a little more age appropriate for this conversation, is going to be the facilitator moderator. And we're going to see how well I am at uh, letting go and not controlling things. So. <laughs> This is more of a test about me than about Lucas, but anyway, Lucas has done a great job. It's a privilege to have him on my team. Uh, we talked about this panel. He's the one who put it together, and so uh, thank you for being here, and thanks to Lucas and uh, panelists for uh, doing today. Thank you. Well, thanks for those kind words, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, it's always an honor to be uh, associated with you. Uh, you got a lot of stuff going on, and a great person uh, to have and be around. Um, <clears throat> so the whole idea that I wanted to bring this panel together for was so that we could learn from some successful young business leaders in the Twin Cities. Um, and so right here, we have uh, some pretty top talent in the, uh, in the area and we're gonna learn a little bit more about their launch and how they are doing today. Um, so with that, I will start by introducing our panelists. Um, right here we have Austin Bolig. Uh, he worked for Piper and Loop Ventures prior to launching um, a company called Let's Go, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Um, then we have Stephanie Campbell, who is found how to make more time out of no time. Um, she works a full-time role at a marketing agency in the town, and then she also owns and operates two uh, Bella Bridesmaids franchises, one in Minneapolis and one in Milwaukee, um, and she'll expand on that. Um, and then we have Dan Nelson. Uh, Dan and I both went to St. John's and we're in the entrepreneurship program, and that's how I uh, started following him. He's a great, uh, great guy, and uh, so he started a company called Olio, um, if I pronounced it right. Um, and so that, <clears throat> he started that while he was in the program in college and is still running that to this day. Um, on top of that, he is a real estate agent uh, with Edina Realtors um, and is in the top performing group with that. And he also is a real estate investor. Um, and finally, we have Marcy Townstead. Uh, Marcy has worked in the architecture field for over 20 years mm -hmm. and recently uh, kind of branched off and started or helped start uh, a new a new company so she'll talk on that a little bit um, and so <clears throat> to kind of lay the framework for this discussion uh, let's kind of start about and just go down the line um, let's start to talk about what inspired you to jump into entrepreneurship um, yeah start with me Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so prior to launching Let's Go, I worked at a venture capital firm, and I got to see firsthand uh, launching successful startups, and I thought that was always so cool to be able to launch your own company. Um, but um, for me, I wanted to launch something that I thought could 
improve people's lives um, and finding something that can make people's lives better. And so I thought I had an idea that could check two of those boxes and um, just being able to see how the startup scenes work firsthand was really exciting for me. Cool. Um, for me, I just knew I always wanted something more as simple as that is. Um, I loved working, but knew as soon as we started a family, I didn't want to be a nine to five working woman. Um, I wanted something else, so I started looking. Long story short, Bella came in my lap. Um, that's where I am. Um, <clears throat> so growing up, my mom was a real estate agent, and through that, she was also an investor. So I got to see firsthand what it was like to run your own business. And so growing up, she kind of raised me the same way, and uh, a lot of my friends were getting allowance. And uh, for me, it was a little different. She said, well, there's a lawnmower in the garage, there's uh, rakes and whatever. And so she kind of helped me start my first business that way uh, and got a taste of basically earning as much as I could with, the, uh, with my own efforts. So that was kind of cool. Uh, and then segue to St. John's, the East Scholars Program um, kind of sparked that again and reignited the, uh, the businesses uh, as they are today. And what, in what inspired me? to eventually make the leap. Um, I come from generations of entrepreneurs, my family, uh, especially my paternal side. There's a lot of entrepreneurs on that side. So I watched, lived vicariously through that. Um, but then I never really saw it in myself. I never thought that was me too until recently. And it, what it took was working my way through the ranks um, in the architecture field and eventually making my way up the ladder and, and then finding my own, arriving at my own idea, there's a better way to do this. I mean, everyone has their own way of doing things and they're all, they all have equal merit, but I wanted to take a stab at it. Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> and a commonality of seeing an opportunity and chasing it. Um, and that's, that's what you all are doing. Um, so Austin, you have a kind of a unique experience on being on kind of both sides of the deal flow. You spent some time as an investment banker, then a venture capitalist, um, and then specifically then launching your own company. Um, were there any takeaways that you got from kind of seeing both sides of the picture beforehand? Yeah, um, probably from the investor side, what I've learned from the venture capitalists is how much they like to say no. Um, uh, and that's a good thing though, just given that the rate of how fast startup or how many startups fail, like they need to say no a lot. But what I took away from that is um, venture capitalists and investors aren't looking for home runs, they're looking for grand slams. And so if I wanted to launch something, I knew in my eyes it had the opportunity to be a grand slam. Because um, when you're pitching these guys and girls, um, uh, that's that's at the end of the day what they're looking for, something that can drive meaningful returns for their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, and so, Stephanie, how did you know that Bella Bridesmaids was the right business for you? Mm -hmm. um, and on the time management side, how do you know what to do and what not to do? Um, well, when I started looking, we kept our options open. Um, my husband's actually a farmer, so we started more in like the agricultural food-based industries just because we had the space and kind of resources. Um, but after looking at a different, lot of business models, realized that I personally was not ready to give up my consistent income um, with my job, just lifestyle-wise and everything. Um, so we looked at something that was more of an add-on or an added value. Um, and that's when we found Bella, and I realized that I could still work my full-time job and manage a team um, successfully and grow a business as well. Um, in terms of time management, you definitely have to be good at that. Um, I look start each week and really month looking at both jobs and what priorities there are, and then layer in my social aspect um, in time with my family after that, but it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely making the most out of a busy schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so Dan, you've been involved with real estate, whether it's on the buying side, whether it's on the selling side, um, or even on the servicing side. What, what is the attractive factor to that space and, and what makes you passionate about going to work every day? So uh, the thing that I was actually talking at the table about was just that there's so many different angles to the real estate world that you can be successful. So the idea is that you could buy a duplex and call yourself an investor. You could buy a hundred unit building and call yourself an investor. I really like that, that everybody kind of has a shot at it. It's kind of an open field for anybody to, to go after it. From the service standpoint, I think there's just a lot of room for growth there too. So that's, that's also attractive. I think there's, it's one of those things that, that there's so many, so many opportunities across um, 
specifically our industry, we serve Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies. Their portfolios are massive and they're, they're far reaching. So that's another big opportunity. And on the sales side, I mean, I, I love to talk to people. I love to kind of build that as part of my life. So um, it just so happens that real estate's where I grew up and I found a really nice niche there. So uh, real estate in general, um, of course, different angles on it, but at the end of the day, uh, serving people and, and doing a good job is what makes me passionate about it. Yeah, great. Um, and then Marcy, you've worked in various roles for almost 20 years in architecture and being under the uh, 30 and 40 mark still, that's about half of your life. Um, when did you start <laughs> visualizing? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's an expert. <laughs> um, but when did you start visualizing, preparing, and taking the steps to start your own business? What did that kind of look like for you? Um, and how did you know timing was right to take that leap? Well, um, when was the timing right? It was never right. <laughs> um, it's still not right. I mean, you just eventually need to have the confidence in yourself to do it. Um, but going back, when did I first start visualizing and thinking about um, being an entrepreneur and being my own boss? Um, started doing it in college. Um, graduated high school. Um, thought I knew all kinds of stuff. Uh, went to undergrad. Thought I knew all kinds of more stuff. And then um, went to graduate school. Realized exactly what I didn't know. Um, there's, there's a quote out there, and I, I, this is one of my favorite quotes by Mark Twain. Um, Education is the path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. <laughs> and um, so all through undergrad, all through high school, undergrad, I thought, yeah, you know, I see this in my family and I can, I can see possibly, you know, I, I don't know what I would do, but I could be my own boss. Well, then I um, started working my way through the ranks in college, master's degree then getting my real world experience and slowly started eroding, I need to learn a whole lot more than what I know right now. And um, so I put my head down and got to work. I worked my tail off um, at various architecture firms, seeing different ways of doing things, working for very different people, but always staying in my, my niche. I knew I wanted to do residential. Mm -hmm. I wanted to craft, um, very personal environments. I knew what I wanted to do, but I uh, intentionally sought out very different ways of doing it. And then, um, you know, you work your way through the ranks and slowly you get more and more opportunity to work with the higher ups and your bosses and your supervisors. And then late nights working in the studio, you start talking and you realize, okay, they're just as uncertain as I am. But they made the leap knowing that they had the, the skills, the tools, and the confidence that they would figure it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, what actually made the timing right for me was people, my relationships with people, and then reconnecting with some old colleagues. And um, actually, we were on the same page, a good colleague of mine that I met when we were wee little interns. And we thought, what if we did? do this and we did this together mm -hmm. and so we did yeah no that's a great story mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's it's interesting because as as an entrepreneur you have that aha moment and then everything seems so clear and then the more that you chase it you realize holy crap I don't I don't know anything <laughs> and you kind of have to reinvent the wheel with uh, <laughs> kind of going through that learning experience um, but yeah no super interesting story so from, from the perspective of barriers to entry, that's something that if you're ever talking with a venture capitalist, that's one of the things they're going to be looking at. What, what were your barriers to entry and how did you get over them? And was it just a straight path forward or did you have to create, you know, kind of a creative solution? And anyone can answer or fill in. Yeah, um, my barriers to entry, so let's go as an app. So I have no technical experience. 
Um, but the good news is, is you don't really need technical experience to develop an application. It definitely helps. Um, but there's a lot of firms out there that help you do that. So one barrier to en entry in the tech space is just understanding that. Um, but you quickly learn, like when you're, because nice thing about a lot of the firms around here, like MentorMate is who we work with, um, they do a good job of teaching you. So if technical is your biggest fear, like I don't know how to code, I still don't know how to code, but we have an app out there that's been live for two years and um, running just fine. My biggest barrier, which is kind of unique, is trying to set up or purchase a business while you're working full time and the government's only open from 9 to 4 p.m. And you can't really step away from your desk, especially with the open op office concept that is like so popular nowadays. Yeah. Um, so I would say setting up a company when you're trying to do something else at the same time and can't really let anyone else know about it. Um, it still happens to me today. Tuesday, I was trying to catch a flight to Denver, trying to call the unemployment office at the same time, trying to set something up. and. It's just finding those little tidbits of time and being good with your time management and making sure that whatever priority is that day needs to get done. Yeah, so there's three different channels for me. So there's the real estate sales side and the biggest barrier there was age. Um, I had a lot of experience with my mom being in the business and you know, I, I knew I had the same kind of thing. It's like I knew it was in me, but, but a lot of my clients didn't know it was in me initially. So breaking through that was, was tough. And then also uh, talking with other agents and them kind of looking down on you being young. Um, so that's why I grew my beard out. It kind of <laughs> makes you look a little older. <laughs> but, so that's my real estate thing. But uh, Olio, same deal. It's the technology side of things. I had no idea how to code. We now have a really robust software platform that, um, you know, I kind of did the school hard knocks on, on coding, and now we outsource a lot of that now too. But uh, that was a barrier most definitely. And with Olio, the clients we work with are extremely hard to get in with. So Fortune 500s are there's probably five, six gatekeepers before you actually get to the person that actually makes the decision. So those two things within Olio and then the real estate investment side is a world. Um, I guess anybody, that's again, going back to my first point is that's a really cool industry that anybody can tap into. But um, some of the larger projects, for example, we did a 100 unit apartment complex in Texas. It's another state with a lot of money involved, a lot of investors involved, a lot of people's homes involved. So that, that was a barrier for sure is getting the, uh, the pieces pulled together there. So that, I guess, would be something where I'd advise if you are facing those barriers, uh, lean on people that know what they're doing. So finding, finding resources that can help you through the way. Because um, I for sure wasn't the expert on that project, but I brought people in that were. So that was a cool project to, to work on. I 100% agree. Bringing in the resources to make up for. You definitely need to know what your strengths are. You need to equally acknowledge what your weaknesses are. And uh, for me, that, that was the heart of getting over my barriers. So I remember when I was a wee little child, when I had my own little lemonade stand, my dad explained business to me <laughs> as uh, being a three-legged chair. So you need to do the work. You need to get paid for the work. And you need to go out and find the work. And it was that third leg, going out and finding the work, that was the most daunting for me. And um, the colleague that I ran into uh, a few, five years ago now, uh, reconnected with when we were interns, she was, that, that's her wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. My wheelhouse is doing the work and doing it better than, I think, at least, um, <laughs> than the rest. Um, she complements my weaknesses and vice versa. I mean, she has weaknesses too. And we are, it, it's all about finding the right team, the right yeah. partnership, complementary partnerships. Yeah. And kind of funneling into the next question, <clears throat> uh, you know, when you're going in the idea generation phase, it's usually, or usually just you or a small group of people, and you kind of have to wear multiple hats. How do you go from, you know, the hat rack to this is my single hat, and how are you figuring out what makes the right people to partner with or the right people to do work with. Have you ever kind of talk on that? Yeah. Um, it's a tough thing to do because um, it's kind of your startup, your baby. You don't want to start handing things off. You always think you could probably do stuff better, but as your business grows, you need to hand it off. You'll drive yourself nuts. Um, and so the people that I find, it's kind of like a gut feeling. Um, I like to find people that you know already. Um, 
uh, and trust already. Um, and it's kind of a give them a, I, I've always just gave them a little bit more work at a time. And if they know they can get more and now it's to the point where I'm just talking with my business partner and he says, give me this, like, you know, he wants to completely manage that, which is great. And so um, when they start asking for more, that's when I kind of know like, okay, great, you're ready to rock and roll. Awesome. Um, for me, I think it's just looking at yourself first and understanding what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Personally, I know I'm very good at operational high level management, making the hard decisions. Um, and then putting the right people in the places. Um, seeing I work full-time and own two businesses, I obviously need full-time employees, managers. So I make sure personally that my managers that are in the stores every single day are good at which what I am not good at, which is the details, and just making sure that all executions are flawless. So I think making sure your team is real, well-rounded, uh, you're kind of covering all the different bases is really important. So the, the question to be clear is how do you delegate out or like how yeah. do you determine who to delegate mm -hmm. out? find the best like I think we can all agree on that uh, at least from what I've heard and we'll, we'll see here but it's it's just one of those things like um, the Oleo group team would probably be the best example of this because I used to have this huge team we had a ton of employees and it, I, you know I was doing that for the wrong reasons I didn't really uh, know what I wanted out of the business so we, we actually cut the team way down and now it's only the very very best um, and in their, in their own capacity, they're all way better than me at what they do. So our sales guys are way better than um, me at sales. My accounting team is way better than I am at accounting. Um, our operations team way, is way better than I am at operations. So just kind of giving them the ropes, um, providing some sort of outline of how you want things to go, and then letting them create their own thing from that was uh, probably my biggest lesson over the past couple of years is set the framework and let them do their thing because they are the expert. Um, so just lean on them, lean on, lean on your team, for sure. Um, yeah, so there's uh, another saying out there that I like a lot. Um, Jack of all trades mentality leads to master of none. Um, if you wanna be an entrepreneur, you need to know what you can be a master at, and you need to stay in that wheelhouse and delegate out whatever is outside of that wheelhouse. It takes a lot of discipline. You want to do it all. It's cheaper to do it all. Do it yourself, learn how to do it yourself. Learn QuickBooks and do accounting all by yourself. I mean, there's a reason why accountants can charge what they can. Um, but uh, same thing with lawyers, same thing with all the other advisors that one needs mm -hmm. to smartly run a business. And um, so I would take, um, Stephanie's comment about knowing your strengths, mm -hmm. what's your wheelhouse, but then layer on top of it, what's the value of your time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, give yourself a monetary amount and crunch the numbers and think about it. Um, that in and of itself was a way for me to realize, okay, this is what I need to delegate out. And I am okay paying someone a higher bill rate for work to be done in two hours versus <laughs> myself at my bill rate taking four hours to do it and probably doing it wrong. yeah and probably <laughs> thank you and probably that's, that's doing it wrong yeah, the first insane. time around and so <laughs> it's eight hours having to redo it yep. mm -hmm. that's what i've done that myself yep. yeah um so obviously there you know you're up here because you've had success with what you're doing but along that that route what are some of the bigger failures that you've had and how did that shape how you do business now There's so many. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, um, I, I listen to this great podcast. Uh, it's called Masters of Scale. I highly recommend it if you guys like startups and business. And he always begins it with saying that a CEO is constantly putting out fires. Um, and that's very, very true, I feel like, um, where it's kind of a bad mindset to have, but you kind of learn when you're kind of leading a company, like you wake, okay, what's gonna go wrong today? Um, and so you just kind of get used to it. Um, one thing that I've learned too, there's not one failure that has caused the end of my company, even though at, at the time you think it might, but you're gonna to get to the next day. And so um, I would say most failures aren't gonna be the end of you. It may seem like it, but you just kinda of have to take a deep breath, think through it, you're a smart person, you're gonna be able to get through it. Yeah. On that note, I feel like a lot of my, I don't know, thinking or life is just day to day, trying to get through the next day, um, especially during our busy season. But I think just, I mean, obviously learn from your failures, but don't continue or dwell on them. 
Um, one thing I always try and do with my staff because I'm not in the store all the time is when I do make a mistake or something comes up, I will fully admit it and go above and beyond to try and fix it in front of them and point out the faults of wherever they were. Um, the last thing I want, because I'm not there every day, is them making a mistake, being embarrassed and hiding it, and then that mistake trickling down and creating 10 more. Um, so I think just being open about it, it's also good, I feel like for me personally, to just continue to admit when I'm wrong, says my husband. Um, so <laughs> we try and get through that. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like echoing the same message. I think um, it's timely. I'm reading Extreme Ownership, the uh, Navy SEALs book, if you guys have read that before. But um, owning your mistakes and knowing that if someone on your team makes a mistake, it's still your fault because they were trained by you and they did it wrong because you taught them wrong. So it's kind of the same concept. It's If somebody does something wrong, it's because I taught them wrong, and taking ownership of that is, is super important. Um, but also realizing that the first mistake should be the only mistake of that particular thing. So taking that mistake as a lesson, realizing it wasn't the right outcome and never letting it happen again based on reflection and figuring out what went wrong down the chain. Because if you're making the same mistake over and over and over, um, something's got to change. But we, we do accept any sort of error, learn from it, and then just try not to ever do it again. Our office handles failure, for lack of a better word, um, as a learning opportunity. It takes a lot of strength to stand up and, and you know, admit failure, be it, embrace the embarrassment and everything like that, but um, no one ever grows from doing things right all the time. <coughs> um, failure is where you grow, and it's really important for us in our firm, our culture, to take time after a major milestone in a project or a major meeting or a major just interaction with a client, stop and think about what went right. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge what could have been done better and then think about, okay, how am I gonna handle it better next time? But then also layer on the fact that, okay, this went right and make sure that what you're gonna be doing different next time doesn't interfere with what you're already doing really well and what you're acknowledged by clients and other people for doing really well. So we, we try, it, it's a daily reminder to not consider failing or failure or just fail as a four letter word. Mm -hmm. It's always a learning opportunity and um, there's value in it, more <laughs> value in it than doing things correctly and well, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's a great way to look at it. Um, so, when you're starting and running a business, it's a major time commitment. Um, you're going to spend probably more time with your business than you will with your family. Um, and so you need to make sure that what you're doing you love. How, how when, you know, things are going to be tough. So how, are, how do you react to kind of your mission and vision when things are going south? Or if you've had a rough patch, what, what keeps you going and, and chasing that goal? Yeah, um, I would say so a little bit of background on Let's Go. Um, so we're an app that helps couples find new date night experiences. Our model is we help them build great relationships. We thought the world had enough apps to help people find dates, but what, what, what the world really needed was a better solution to helping people build great relationships after they meet the right person. Um, and when it comes to building a great relationship, we think it's all about finding common interests between you and your partner and specifically sharing great experiences. And so kind of knowing that and getting feedback from like our users emailing us, say, hey, me and my husband was we're on a first date night for the first time in three years because of your app that kind of makes me feel good um, and then um, um, other type of stories like that so just going back when you hear that kind of gets you out of those dumps as well um, being in a seasonal business, I feel like I'm kind of lucky because our summer months are a slow time because that's when all the weddings occur. Um, and our winter times are crazy busy months. And so I really do enjoy seeing the numbers climb every single day during those months. I mean, you kind of take your time off during the summer and that's also when your customer service problems happen. So it is really easy to get down on yourself and ask why you did this. Um, but personally, it's just seeing the numbers grow every month and holding yourself more accountable each and every month. Um, whether there's a virus that takes out half of China where your, where your production <laughs> facilities are or um, whatever it may be. But. Um, 
it's a little cliche, but like knowing why you're working so hard is always important. I work seven days a week. I'm sure we all work seven days a week. And it's just one of those things that it's very easy to see maybe friends or family or whatever taking some time off. And, and for me, it's just realizing that um, all the work put in today will lead to a better tomorrow and just realizing that uh, you got to keep building, especially at, at my age, at our age, it's like put in maybe 10 years of work in five years time and those extra five years will be exponentially better it's kind of the, the what I always tell myself if I'm really grinding through a day or through a week or even a month um, that's one of the biggest things and there's a second part to my my thought but I'll, I'll see if I can come back to that okay. <laughs> um, being able to come home at night to my family and having a good network of professional colleagues people who aren't necessarily in the same industry as me, but having my network is what keeps me aligned with my mission and my vision, uh, our vision, the company's vision. Um, seeing the impact of what I do on my clients' lives, I need to seek out and remind myself of that because it's very easy to get bogged down in the weeds um, and lose, lose, your, lose the pulse on your vision. Mm -hmm. it takes, that's another thing that takes discipline. But um, it's the people. It's my network. And um, as much as I like to put my head down and get the work done, I need to look up, I need to stand up and go um, be with people. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's great. Um, so what are a few kind of techniques or specific actions that you guys have developed to take on new challenges? Is there, you know, you're going to face problems that you never thought of before. How do you kind of take that in and, and learn from each of the new problems coming up? Yeah. One thing I like to do is, is talk to someone who's done it before. Um, so probably using your network, um, whether it's from like beginning to starting a company. One thing that I've learned, which is great about the entrepreneurs in Minnesota or Minneapolis, is they love to help. Um, one of the things that like it's, I think it's like just a common thing that these people end like, how can I help you at the end? They're willing to help, um, but you can learn a lot from people that have done it before. And that's kind of like the best source or resource, like when you want to tackle a new challenge get some feedback from someone who's done it before. Um, and I think that will definitely set you up better than if you didn't. Yeah. Kind of building on his point, um, Bella Bridesmaids is a franchise with 60 locations throughout the United States. So I'm fortunate enough that um, there are 60 other owners that I can reach out to at any time and ask for questions. Um, all diverse backgrounds um, and experience levels that have, some have been in the business for years, some have been in it for 12 years. So really leaning on them and Although we're all very different and we all run our businesses very different, um, every bridal situation is unique and different. Um, every bride is different. Every bridesmaid is different. So between kind of everyone, you really get to, get to bounce ideas off and problems off lots of different people, which I'm very fortunate for. The question again, sorry. How do you solve the problem? Uh, yeah. How do you solve the problem? It's, <laughs> it's kind of along those same lines. It's just lean on your team. I, I can't uh, stress that enough. Um, and knowing that in some instances, like, so Olio is my experience to lean on my team because I do have a, a really solid team in real estate. You're kind of a lone wolf. You're, I don't work on a big team. Um, so it's just knowing that no one's going to solve it for you. Sometimes you just got to be disciplined and learn it. Um, so sometimes Google is your best advocate, there's the best resource. Um, so there's kind of two angles to that. If, if you are by yourself and can't find the answer, definitely um, you know, buckle down and do some research. But if you do have a team, lean on that team and make sure that um, you have a sound wall to kind of get some feedback on your ideas from. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, you're going to be faced with challenges all the time. I mean, some are going to be huge, some are going to be minuscule. and what it all boils down to is being resourceful, like exactly what everyone else here has said. Mm -hmm. um, if there is something lacking in college education right now is how to be resourceful. <laughs> um, a lot of times that's people, a lot of times that's information that you can glean from the internet, which has its own, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, level of complication. But um, it's, uh, 
developing your skills at being resourceful. There will always be challenges. Yeah. <clears throat> um, is there any, any questions in the audience? Anyone have any, any questions? Yeah. Well, I've had the privilege and sometimes the drama of working with some very young entrepreneurs who have gone through entrepreneurship <laughs> programs and are just coming out, but they've got great products, so they've got tremendous potential. And I've noticed that there's something missing in what they learned. And I think that's a lot of what some of what you've talked about. But if there was one thing that you could have learned when you were just getting going and, and, and just maybe going through one of the programs that you wish education, I think you said being resourceful, but even further than that, what's that one thing that maybe would make it an easier transition from being a school kid to being a true entrepreneur and getting out the world? And, and for the people on the other side of the room, if you couldn't hear, uh, her question was, is what are <clears throat> those things outside of, of being resourceful that, that people aren't learning in an entrepreneurship program currently that they can um, help them adjust from being in almost a, a school world to the real world? Yeah, um, I would say the one thing, that, the best advice I got from doing this, which I didn't realize I had to focus on, was um, I think entrepreneurs focus too much on the product or the actual technology of what you're building, but like I never learned about marketing strategies, distribution channels, which at the end of the day is the most important thing. You have the best product in the world, but if no one buys it, you're done. So better, getting a better understanding on your dis the different distribution channels out there. A great book for that is called Traction. Um, that's the best book out there for that. Um, better understanding that would be something that I wish I would have learned more about. Yeah, great book. Um, I'd say number one, having like an actual working background before jumping into entrepreneurship, because there's so much you can learn. But what I wasn't prepared for, I guess, um, was just the level of training you need for your employees. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, it's really hard to get good employees right now. Um, no one seems to want a job. So just making sure that the ones you have, you are able to get the time with them to train them effectively understand their communication methods, um, but just kind of more on the HR side of it and keeping in place. Yeah, that's a tough question. I, I, I don't really know if there's anything that you can teach because a lot of it is you just got to get kind of, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Like for me, it felt like I was just getting pushed around for a couple of years because I just didn't know. And that's the best lessons that I've learned. I think, honestly, the first couple of years being how hard they were was probably more beneficial than the four years of college that I had. So. For me, I guess there's not really one thing I would learn. I think you do, do just kind of drink from the fire hose for the first couple of years and you'll learn very fast. Um, I would say, well, a lot of the young, um, young architects, young drafts people, young people in my profession, the thing that's lacking to me and and the thing that we put the most time and effort into training is customer service um, in in my opinion I mean let's face it no matter what you do for a living whether you're developing a product or curating experiences for people you are in customer service and that's what will make or break your company it's how special do you make people feel when they use your product when they interact with you and how well do you listen I mean Listening, 101, active listening. Mm -hmm. That is something in and of itself that we spend a lot of time working with our people on. Um, and so I don't know how that translates to an entrepreneurship program. I don't know how, um, but this is just um, basic interpersonal communication. Mm -hmm. And how do you leave, th think about, thinking about how do you leave someone feeling at the end of a conversation? That's really the question that is at the heart of our training. Yeah. No oh, great perspectives. Uh, in the back. Dan, could you tell us what Olio does? Yeah. So uh, Olio is a managed service provider. <clears throat> the the traditional business model is um, the at least in our experience, the Fortune 500 companies, for example, they have maybe 500 locations or 1,000 locations, give or take, and Traditionally, their on-site managers will be contacting vendors to perform services for their locations. So what we've done is we built a platform where they can basically onboard all of their locations into our system. And what we've got is a, a vendor database. 
so we can pair those vendors up with the service needs of that particular site. So from a corporate level, you've got the, the upper management, maybe middle management, and then the local management of each particular site. We help consolidate all of that to one platform. So really what it breaks down to is a cost savings for the, for the company, because if you figure one on-site manager spending 10 hours a year or 20 hours a year or 30 hours a year sourcing, onboarding, and managing a vendor at X dollars per hour, we don't charge a premium on the services that we, we um, perform for our clients. So there's a cost saving aspect to that side and then the vendors um, have a benefit because we have tons of locations that they can serve and we don't, we don't charge our clients a premium, premium and we don't necessarily discount our vendor service prices either. Um, our vendors at a market rate are getting paired, pay, paid very fair rates and our clients typically have a little bit more of a budget than maybe your um, average Joe store, um, corner store. So long story short, we're a technology platform that bridges large companies with large portfolios with vendors across the United States. Yeah. I, 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 love, I love this panel here. You've got some great information. Uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, your journey with uh, skills development and all. I was just curious uh, what the importance of personal development, how you became a better version of yourself, how that kind of factored into your journey. I can talk. So that is actually my fear eventually is Right now, I'm working full time in an advertising agency, and I am always learning the most up to date media vendors, technology of what's going on. Like, everything's always in my face, and I'm constantly learning. So, when I do quit my full time job and eventually just be a store owner, and I don't have that education, that is my biggest fear is where am I going to get this? Um, but I think I'll just have to find another avenue. I'm very fortunate with a strong uh, franchise owners and leaders, um, they're always up in the up to date of what's going on. Um, but then I think I'm just personally going to have to find another outlet or something that keeps me learning because you're right, I am scared for when that day comes. For me, um, I, I had that same fear and, and for a short time had that same kind of gap of, of learning. I had everything in front of me. I was in school and everything was coming to me. Um, so I always felt like I was in front of things. But at a certain point, I felt like I I'd remember this very specifically. I wasn't meeting with my mentors or getting that feedback about growing and things like that. So I kind of had, I, and I still have my mentor, uh, mentors now, but um, I really picked up audiobooks. I don't have to, well, maybe I have time to read, but I, I, I don't <laughs> tend to read. But I listen to at least a book a week um, through Audible and then podcasts. So I kind of found my little groove on how to stay up to date on information. So, so staying from a global perspective up to date, I've got my morning routine. So I listen to multiple podcasts, very short podcasts, and then consistently one book a, a week to just keep growing. So finding channels where you can still get exposure, so maybe some feedback yeah. would be, there, there are things out there outside of just the, the ecosystem of your business mm -hmm. that can keep you, what I would say, sorry, a quick little tangent too, is what I learned in school, I think I've learned 10x out of school through the books and through the podcasts and things. So. Uh, that's what I would say from a personal development standpoint. You can accelerate that as fast as you want. Okay. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Well, if you could go back to your younger self, back when you, before you started your business, what's the one thing you would tell yourself to do or not do, and why? Take a business class in college. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, more from like a business answer, um, it goes back to kind of what I was hinting at before. I wish, I didn't, I, just because I'm not a marketing major, I underestimated how important it is um, to understand and have capital to put towards effective distribution channels. If I would have done it over again, I would have allocated a lot less towards the actual product development mm -hmm. and more towards there so we could have been higher because one thing that I realized when it comes to product development, you may think it's a great idea, but your consumers may, users may not think of it. And so getting that feed, getting as much user, f learning to get as much user feedback as possible, as early as possible, was a key thing I learned and am now implementing going forward. Yeah, awesome. The, the, the phrase uh, work smarter, not harder is probably the most important thing for, for me. Um, you know, growing up in sports, it was easy to just work harder and just get it done and kind of grit you use your grit to get stuff done and um, as much as I still have that grit to me I think I'm a lot more strategic so work a lot smarter than I have to work hard um, 
So that's probably the advice I would give myself. Be a little more strategic going into things and you won't have to work nearly as hard with maybe even a better outcome. Yeah, great piece of advice. So kind of we're approaching one. Um, so kind of wrapping it up, uh, just a quick 30 seconds to a minute. Um, what, what do you think is, is the main takeaways that people should take today? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, for me, it's, I think, um, I guess what I've really appreciated from le learning from other entrepreneurs is entrepreneurship isn't necessarily an age thing. Um, I've met people who started their business when they were 15. I've met people who started their business when they were 65, 75 years old. So it's really, there's not really an age um, for entrepreneurship. I think it's more of a mindset thing. A lot of what we've shared today is about just kind of taking that step into it, challenging yourself, getting out of your comfort zone, stuff like that. Um, so for whatever stage you're at, I think there's always a window or an opportunity for you to go after it uh, and never discount at what stage of life you are because um, entrepreneurship, I think, is just your mindset. I would say if you have a passion or an interest in something, just start exploring it. Um, I Three or four years ago, I thought I had an interest in personal styling, so I started my own personal styling business for women throughout the metro area that needed help, whether it be everyday clothes or work, uh, clothes for work. Because um, it seems like once women start working, having kids, it's, they need help. So got a bunch of clients, was helping women, loved it because it was very rewarding for them and for me um, being able to help people. What, what I found very quickly is that working a nine-to-five job, then running to the mall after, and then trying to make sure that they have what they need at the end of the nine o'clock day, then getting compensated for it just like wasn't worth it for me at the end of the day. I was spending way too much time and energy and not getting compensated for it. And it was honestly exhausting. Um, but ironically, what the underlying thought is that I always had when I was with these women is, wow, I wish I had my own store that I could just bring people to me, have one location and help them. And then ironically, which I never honestly would have dreamed of this because I've never worked retail in my life. Um, now I own my own business where women come to me, I help style them and they go on their way. So just exploring and testing things out. You're not going to find like the perfect avenue right away. It takes a lot of time and exploration. I would say kind of like we talked about it, it's going back to that failure. Like I've learned, like you're going to fail. Um, don't let it get discouraged. Um, you can learn, you're going to learn from them and going back to what I learned, um, as long as it's not a detrimental, crazy um, failure, mo I'd say 99% of them you can come back from and you're going to learn from them and make you smarter. And one thing that I've actually learned, a lot of your failures are actually good things when you look back. You're like, okay, I'm glad that we had that little small development happen. I was able to find this. So a lot of blessings in disguise you find out when you launch your company. And so um, failure isn't always a bad thing, I've learned. Awesome. Then um, if I can echo uh, something that, Daniel, you said, um, entrepreneurship is very much a mindset, regardless of age. Um, I do think, though, that younger ages, the younger cohorts have an advantage. Um, when when um, we talk about, at, at my firm, when we talk about business, we're blessed to be doing very, very well right now. Mm -hmm. But our conversations are all about where are we gonna be in three to five years? Where are we gonna be in 10 years? Um, there's, there's another quote, um, actually uh, by Helen Hayes, an American actress. You rest, you rust. And I think my band director back in high school told me that. <laughs> and, and it's just stuck with me all these years. And give yourself time to appreciate the good times, but never lose sight of where you're headed. And um, Think about how your craft is evolving. First of all, know your craft. Take the time to learn your craft before making the leap, but um, know how your craft is evolving and how are you gonna stay relevant in that. And personally, I think that the younger generations can answer that question more readily. Um, if I can be biased. <laughs> um, and so I do think that there is an advantage to a certain age range. Um, it, entrepreneurship is a mindset. Some people have it, some people don't. And um, it can be difficult to learn. You can learn it. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for it. You can learn whatever you want to learn. But um, 
there's something about being at that age where you're a little more willing to take a risk or you're really, you are more willing to respectfully challenge the status quo. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, if we give a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you very much. For, uh, <clears throat> thank you, everyone who came. Uh, we do have the room as long as you'd like, so if you want to stay around and, and chat, feel free. Um, the panelists may stick around uh, if, if you have some specific questions, um, but look forward to, uh, we'll have this video up on YouTube in about a week if you want to watch anything that um, you saw today again. Um, and thanks again for everyone for coming. <laughs>